Yeah, our second speaker of the session is uh, Ulrike Schmidt Kreplin. I, I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. So, yeah, and, great. Yeah, and she's uh, going to be talking about popular brand chains and their dual certificates. Uh, take it away, Ulrike. Thanks a lot uh, for the introduction. So, this is joint work with Teliki Pali Kavita, Tomasz Karali, um, Janik Matuszka, and Ildiko Schlotta. And before I jump into the problem definition, I would like to give you a brief idea about the application that we had in mind when we started the project. So the application is a novel voting scheme, which is known under the name liquid democracy. And actually it has gained increasing attention both in theory and in practice within recent years. So the idea is the following. Imagining an organization which is facing many questions each day, and ideally, it would like to answer those questions in a democratic way. Then one issue is often that not every person uh, feels like an expert for, uh, expert for any question. So liquid democracy wants to give every person the possibility to either vote on the question at hand directly or to delegate his or her voting power to some other voter that she, he or she trusts. And then delegations are transitive. So if I delegate my vote to a friend of mine, then my vote might end up at the friend of my friend. Even though this might seem or sound natural at first sight, there's an inherent problem to this idea, and that is the appearance of delegation cycles. So in practice, normally, the voting power in that case is then just lost. And of course, it's not very desirable. So several authors have uh, thought about what one could uh, do about this. And one suggestion was, to let voters name a whole set of possible delegates instead of only one delegate. And ideally, voters would also give a preference relation over their set of accepted delegates. But then suddenly, there's a need for a mechanism which selects for every voter one of its delegates without creating any, de uh, any delegation cycles. So if we think about it in graph theoretical terms, what we would have to do is to select one outgoing arc, or at most one outgoing arc per, um, per node, such that in, do in total we don't create any cycle. And in order to see uh, what I'm heading at is, let's flip around the edges in this graph. And then of course we have to select one ingoing arc per person without creating any cycle. And that is nothing else than a branching. So let's, um, so this would be one example here. And let's formalize this um, uh, on a graph. So the input of our problem is a directed graph where we have preferences over incoming arcs. And those preferences, they could be of any partial order. Now, what we want to select is a branching that is an acyclic subset of the edges such that each of the nodes has in degree at most one. And ideally, we want to select a branching which somehow reflects the preferences of the nodes. And for that, we are going to define popular, bran uh, popular branchings. But in order to do so, we start off by a pairwise comparison between two branchings. That is defined as follows. So if we have two branchings, B1 and B2, we simply count the number of nodes that strictly prefer branching B1 over B2, and we subtract the number of nodes that prefer B2 over B1. And then if this quantity is um, not negative, then we say that B1 is at least as good as B2. Um, okay, so when, is, when does a node prefer branching B1? Well, we simply assume that it just looks at its in, like the preference on its own ingoing arcs. And if it doesn't have any uh, arc in a branching, then this is always worse than having any arc of the uh, acceptable arcs. Okay, so in this example, we would have two nodes, namely uh, node A and D, which strictly prefer B1 over B2. And we have only one node that prefers B2. And node C is indifferent because he doesn't get any ingoing arc in either of the branchings. So then we define a popular branching as a branching which is at least as good as any other branching in the graph. So this quantity here is gray as uh, non-negative for any other branching B prime. So are there any questions about the definition of a popular branching? If not, I think this would be a great moment uh, to ask them. Okay. 
Great. Um, if not, I would like to check uh, together with you whether a, well, a popular branching always exists in the graph. And um, this is, um, and this is not the case. So here we have an example for a graph which doesn't contain a popular branch. Um, this is a very symmetric example. This is also why I'm only going to check one um, promising candidate and then I hope you um, believe me that none of the branching is popular. So let's pick a branching where at least two of the nodes get their first choice. This would be this branching B. And then we can simply pick this uh, branching B prime and we will see that we have two nodes which prefer the new branching B because now before it didn't get any arc, now it gets a second choice. C now gets his first choice and before had had his um, second choice. And we have only one uh, node which prefers the old branching over the, over the new branching. And one node again is indifferent. So we see that the new branching B prime somehow beats the old branching B. And no matter which branching you pick in this instance, you will always find another branching which beats the original branch. This brings us to the, the problem that we looked at in this paper, and that is namely to decide whether a given instance admits a popular branching or not, and if so, to find one. And in some cases, we will even be able to describe the whole set of popular branchings. But before we go into detail, I would like to stress out that the notion of popularity is definitely not new to our paper, so it has been considered before. Um, in social choice, it's known as, the, uh, as a weak Condorcet say winner, and it's actually known since a few hundred years. And also in combinatorial optimization, it has been uh, considered, especially in um, the context of matchings with preferences. So there you could either look at uh, bipartite matchings or non-bipartite matchings. And what's interesting is that uh, for the non-bipartite question, uh, matching has been a long-standing open question about the computational complexity of the, pop of the popular matching problem in non-bipartite graphs. And just recently, this question has been settled by two groups uh, independently uh, last year. And uh, well, it turned out that this problem is act actually NP-complete. This is in contrast to our um, to our setting where we are actually able to provide a polynomial time algorithm for finding popular branchings um, or showing that they don't exist. But also this algorithm gave us a lot of insight about the problem and with a little more work we were able to, um, for example, describe the popular branching polytope when we restrict ourselves to weak orders. Uh, we also looked at some relaxation, uh, relaxation notions of the problem when popular branchings do not exist and in one case, we were able to solve also the optimization problem in poly time. And in the other case, we provide an approximation algorithm. So today I would like to focus on this polynomial time algorithm for finding popular branchings. Um, yeah, and that's what I would like to start. So without further review, let's um, get started with that. Um, uh, so this algorithm makes a lot of use of a, a characterization in terms of dual certificates. And here's a very high level um, idea or overview of this result that I'm going to show you within the next minutes. So the result will be that a branching B is popular if and only if there exists a dual certificate for it. And the dual certificate in our case will be a family of the subsets of the nodes, which are indicated by those green bubbles here. And of course, this family will have to um, fulfill some conditions. So how do we get there? Well, what we're aiming at is to write down a linear program which can uh, check whether for a given branching whether it's popular or not. And in order to make this LP as simple as possible, I'm going to do a few adjustments to the graph. So the first adjustment that we do is that we add a dummy root node uh, to it, and we connect this node directly to each of the nodes in the original graph. And we will make those direct connections the least preferred ingoing arc of this, no of this node, or of every node. Then we can see that there exists a one-to-one -one correspondence between branches in the original graph and our senses in the new extended graph. Um, just as a reminder, in our sense, nothing else in um, 
and an icyclic uh, subset of the arc such that each of the nodes has in degree one, but besides of the root node. Um, so it's somehow a maximal uh, or maximum possible branch. Okay, but also the, the notion of popularity carries over. So uh, a branching B in the original graph is popular if and only if the corresponding our sense A is popular in the extended graph. And the definition of popularity here just is a, uh, completely the same. So what we want to check now is whether double senses are popular. And in order to do so, we are going to introduce costs on the weights, uh, on, the, on the nodes, uh, as follows. So if we look at the ingoing arcs of a node, we give a cost of zero to the current our sense arc, and also to any other um, arc, which is just as good as this current our sense arc. Um, if we have an arc which is less preferred to the current our sense arc, it gets a weight of minus one. Um, so if it's more preferred to the, the current our sense arc, it gets a weight of minus one. And if it's less preferred than the current our sense arc, it gets a weight of plus one. And now I claim that our, um, our sense A is popular if and only if A is the minimum cost of our sense within this weighted graph. To see this, just observe that A has a uh, has cost of zero. And if we find an our sense with cost smaller than zero, well, then we can uh, then we know that this our sense will beat the current our sense in the pairwise comparison. Um, one more thing that we do is that we would like to avoid negative weights here, again, to make the LP simpler. So we just add well, one to all of the costs. And in such we, uh, so we get non-negative costs, but statement is still true. Finally, we can write down an LP to, to check whether uh, this is popular. So this is just a standard um, our sense LP. We have uh, variables on the arcs. And the only, uh, only non-trivial constraint that we have is this here, which says that if we have, uh, if we take any subset of the nodes, then somehow the ingoing flow should be at least one. So in other words, um, the, if we sum the, of the, va the values over the, on the ingoing cut, then this should be at least one. And it is well known that this um, LP always has a, a binary solution. So we get, that A is popular if and only if the optimal value of this LP is N, which is the number of nodes in the original graph. Um, well, so very strong duality, we can just as well look at the dual LP. And uh, again, we know that um, this LP, from the literature, that this LP always has a binary optimal solution. So let's interpret this. We do have variables on for each of the subsets of the nodes, um, which th those subsets never include the, uh, the dummy root node. And well, if we have a binary optimal solution, we simply select subsets of the nodes into a family of subsets. However, the, these need to um, fill, fulfill the, uh, this, the following condition, namely, if we fix any arc in the, uh, in the graph, then the number of subsets that this arc is allowed to enter is bounded by its own cost. So for example, if we have this arc here, it has a cost of zero, so it's not allowed to enter any of the subsets that we selected. If we have a weight of one, it's uh, allowed to enter one of the subsets and so on. Um, so this is one optimal solution for this, uh, for our example here. Now you could check for every, uh, for every edge that this constraint is actually fulfilled. But we get something more, namely that we can assume with atlas of generality that we always have a lamina family of subsets. So it was not a coincidence that I was able to draw this family here in a lamina way. Okay. Um, so whenever we have, whenever the optimal value of dual LP is n, we are going to call these special solutions, these special optimal solutions, which are binary, binary and have a laminar support, we will call them dual certificates for A. So let's conclude in a more combinatorial way. Uh, a dual certificate is a laminar family of the subsets, such that each of the arcs enters at most uh, the costs as many sets from this family. And each of the other sense arcs needs to enter exactly one of the sets. 
And by complementary selectness, we also get the, the other way around. So each of the sets um, needs to be entered by exactly one of the arcs, one of the other sense arcs. Okay. Um, are there any questions about the dual certificates? Because otherwise I think this would be a good moment. Okay, great. So then let's uh, continue with uh, two observations, which I would like to stress out uh, about them. And the first one is that um, their structure is actually even simpler. Namely, uh, a, a dual certificate can be at most two layered. Uh, so why is that? This is because we have those direct connections from the uh, dummy root node to each of the nodes. And they, they uh, have cost at most two. So they are allowed to enter at most two sets. Uh, so in other words, each of the nodes can be included in at most two of the subsets. And by that we get that the family is at most two layers. Um, and this is also why I'm going to talk about outer dual sets and inner dual sets because this is the whole structure that we can have. So we have outer dual sets and inside there will be singleton inner dual sets. The second uh, observation that I would like to do is that um, if we look at one of those outer dual sets, then the kind of arcs or the set of arcs that we can use in a popular other sense or in other sense that fits this dual certificate is really restricted, namely, we can only use arcs that are undominated and that dominate all, all of the arcs that come from outside. Why is that? Well, assume for a second that this arc here is not undominated. So there exists one arc, for example, this arc here, that dominates it. Then this arc here would have a weight or a cost of zero. However, it needs to enter the singleton set here. So we have a violation of one of our constraints. Um, and the other observation, so assume for a moment that this arc does not dominate this arc here, which comes from the outside of the dual, uh, of the outer dual set, then this arc here has a weight of either zero or one. And again, it enters two um, sets in the dual certificate, which is again forbidden. And this observation will be quite helpful in designing our algorithm. So in our algorithm, what we want to do is basically we start by selecting or we start by creating the dual certificates and then later fit an other sense to it. So let's assume for a moment that this will be one of our outer dual sets. So the, the set X here would be one of our outer dual sets. Now we just want to formalize what I, what I just told you in your observation, namely, if this is our outer set, which of, the, which of the arcs can we use as our other sense arcs? And those arcs, which, are allow, which we are allowed to use, we call them X safe. So they are safe with respect to this outer dual set. Um, and this is just defined as, again, uh, uh, an arc in order to be safe, it needs to be undominated and it needs to dominate everything that comes from outside. So here, the green edges that I draw here, those are um, X safe in this case. What's nice about uh, this notion of safe arcs is that it's monotone with an X. So whenever we make X larger, then the set of safe arcs can only become larger. Okay. So now we are almost ready to um, note down the algorithm. But before we do so, I would like to give you again like a high level idea about what's, what's going on. So it proceeds in two steps. And in the first step, we're going to try to find a, what I would call largest possible candidate for a dual certificate. So basically, we're going to try to, to build those outer dual sets and make them as large as possible. This will be our candidate. But we don't yet think about an other sense. We only think about the outer dual sets. And in the second step, then, we try to fit an other sense to this candidate for a dual certificate. If we find one, then we can prove that it's popular. And if we don't find one, well, then we will have to prove that that doesn't exist for so the first step in our algorithm, um, here we are preparing the first step. So what we do, what we want to find here is for every node V in the set of nodes, we want to construct um, a largest possible outer dual set. So a bit more formal, it will be the largest set XV 
such that we can reach every other node in this set via a path of safe edges. Okay. And there exists a very easy um, procedure to, to compute them. So here's how it goes. We first, we guess that this set will be the whole node set. So this is what we do here. Uh, so let's guess it would be the whole node set. Then we can compute the uh, set of safe arcs. And then we can check whether we can really reach all of the other, all of the nodes in, in, in this set via safe arcs. In this example, we see that this is not the case because we cannot reach those two nodes. So what we do is we shrink the set and we throw out the ones that we can reach. And then we recalculate the set of safe arcs with respect to this new set here. Well, now again, we see that we have two nodes that we cannot reach, so we uh, throw them out and we update the set. We update the, the um, set of safe arcs and now we've reached a steady state. And so this would be a feasible outer dual set, which we could start in this node here. Mm, and we're going to do this for all of the nodes in B. And what's nice is that this again will give us a lamina family. So you have four minutes, Ulrike. Sorry. sorry okay, yeah, no, that's fine. That's perfect. Thanks. <laughs> um, so in, in particular, um, we can have a look at the maximal sets of this family, family and it will partition the set of nodes. So this is one example here. Um, so we're only interested in the maximal sets of this family. And for every maximal, for every maximal set, we will um, think about one of the some of the nodes as representatives. And the representatives are exactly those that can reach every other one with via safe arcs. Um, and now we're going to construct a new graph, which we call D, D star. And in this new graph, those maximal sets will actually be our new nodes. And together with the dummy root node, which will also be a node. Um, so how do we uh, construct now the edges? Well, we are going to take some of the edges from the old graph, but not all of them. Namely, they have to meet two conditions. The first condition is that we are only interested in arcs that enter the, representative, uh, the representation nodes. So this would be A, B, A and B in this case, and here in this case. And the second condition is that among all uh, arcs that enter representative nodes, they should be undominated. So in this example, we would have to delete this edge and this edge here. This because it doesn't enter at a representative node and this uh, arc here because it is dominated by this arc. Now we get as a, as a lemma that um, whenever we have a popular Arbel sense in the original graph, then we will see this Arbel sense within this new graph. Why? Because um, each of those maximal sets will be entered exactly once, and this popular Arbel sense can only use arcs from E star. So if there exists a popular Arbel sense, we will, there will exist an Arbel sense in this new graph. Um, and this is all already one direction of the theorem that I'm, that I'm going to uh, close with. So um, we have that if there exists a popular Arbel sense, then we have an Arbel sense in this new graph. But the other way around also holds. So if we find any other sense in this graph, then we can simply extend it to an other sense in the original graph by using safe arcs. And we can prove its popularity by simply plugging in the dual certificate. So um, let me conclude. What I presented today was a polynomial time algorithm to solve the popular branching problem which is heavily based on dual certificates. What I didn't show you was that in uh, the case of weak orders, it also comes with a description of the popular branching polytope. And what about um, next direction, directions or open questions? I think the most interesting open question is uh, the complexity of the popular Arbo sense uh, um, problem in general. Just to, uh, for clarity, so we solved one special case of it namely when we have direct connections from the root node to every node in graph. But this is only one special case. So if the graph, um, if we can have arbitrary graphs, then the question how, uh, about the complexity is open. 
And well, it turns out to be much more tricky because uh, the dual certificates, they don't have to be two layered anymore, but they can be much more complex. And we try to uh, generalize our algorithm, which actually worked out, but it's no longer polynomial. So I think this is a very uh, interesting question. So um, thanks a lot for the attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, th thank you very much, Ulrike, for a very nice talk. Uh, can I ask everybody to unmute themselves and give uh, Ulrike a round of applause? It's very nice to see that uh, min-max theorems and polydrug combinatorics finds applications in democracy. Um, yeah. um, are there any questions for Ulrike? Um, there, there is a question. Uh, Karsten, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? Okay, uh, in that case, I'll read the question. You make heavy use of the dual certificate to prove that if you find a solution, it is a popular branching. Uh, what are the pro um, what are the problem specific arguments that are leveraged to show that the dual certificate must be laminar? Um, again, uh, um, um, so what, um, the question was, what is the argument that the dual certificate needs to be laminar? Yeah. Okay. Um, so actually, um, there can exist dual optimal solutions, which are not laminar, but, um, it is just, you can just show that uh, whenever there exists any optimal dual solution, you can somehow rearrange it a bit and then it becomes lamina. And so we just restrict ourselves to those optimal solutions and it just turned out to be, of course, much easier to work with them. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, I think, th does that address your question, Karsten? Yeah, yeah. Um, any other questions? Um, could you clarify again uh, what, uh, what uh, you mentioned a couple of hardness results, uh, one by Fenza et al. and another by Gupta. Could you just uh, clarify what that result is and contrast it with your, uh, with, with your result? Um, yeah, I mean, so basically, I mean, they, they, answer, they, they asked the same uh, question that we asked. So the question like, um, whether, whether it exists a popular matching or not, whether um, this question is uh, hard to decide or not. And what mm -hmm. I just want to point out that in, in, in uh, for popular matchings in non-bipartite graphs, it is actually hard to uh, this decision. And um, in our case, also for popular uh, branching, it's not hard, so. It's not hard. Yeah. Okay, all right, thank you, thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. And thank you, uh, thank you to all for attending the second session. Uh, I'm just gonna uh, inform everybody that uh, we're going to have a conference photo during the next session. All right, just giving you a heads up. Okay, uh, so see you back here in uh, two hours. All right, thank you all, bye-bye. Thank you.